Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the resurrection of our Lord, Easter Sunday, April 4, 2021, are from Acts chapter 10, 34 through 43. The Psalm is Psalm 118, one through two, and then 14 through 24. Second reading is 1 Corinthians 15, one through 11, and we have two possible gospel readings. This is gonna be a hard decision. Mark 16, one through eight, and the alternate gospel is John 20, one through 18. Happy Easter, Sermon Brainwavers, and happy Easter to all the preachers listening out there. Jesus Christ is risen today, hallelujah. Uh, uh, hallelujah. It's hard to sing on Zoom. Triumphant. Okay, I know it is, yeah. Anyway, happy Easter. Happy oh, and look at my background. I can't, so I put my bunnies up. So there's one bunny. You see it? There's one bunny. And then and there's my other bunny. The bunny doesn't see a shadow on Easter. That's I the wrong not. story. I know, I know, but that's a, I, I just have my bunnies up. I have bunnies in different places in my house. So I decorate for Easter. Just the little, little bunnies and chicks and things. Happy Easter things. So anyway, I just wanted you to know that, that my background has changed, that I change my background seasonally. At least I try. So I feel like such an underachiever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Where do we want to start? Do we want to start with Mark or do we want to start with John? Should we start with Mark? How about that? Sure. I just said Mark. How about that? You've been looking at that. Let's start with Mark. Okay. Where do we want to start? Well, this is the greatest of all the Easter stories <laughs> in that, in that no it kidding. still shocks people, uh, I think, when they hear it, or they still wonder, like, is that it? Is that the reading? Or we must be cutting it short for time. I mean, people aren't always sure what's going on. Uh, a lot of people don't understand how to negotiate Mark's endings. People who actually have a Bible open in front of them don't really know what to do uh, with that. But I think you read it at verse 8, and you, and you just you you wrestle with the shock of the whole experience but then you also wrestle with uh what 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 my teacher i know also rolfs and caroline's teacher don jewel said this strange presence of both um of both promise and disappointment at the very end of this story uh the promise that he's going to galilee just as he told you and the disappointment why aren't they happy or why aren't they telling anybody or why isn't everybody seeing this as as the, the the closing of the circle like we do today and then it gives a chance for some honest conversation about discipleship about fear about what does it mean to proclaim somebody come back from the dead what does it mean to now step into the kind of discipleship that jesus talked about uh, especially in mark chapter 13 of, of of difficulty and of the need to bear witness and of the need to step into the um, the spaces that Jesus himself stepped into, which were spaces of suffering and death and 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 decay and and who wants that for their job? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know that the, there's good reason for the terror and we perhaps need to be a little bit more honest about why we aren't terrified by that experience as well. So I mean, Preachers can have a lot of fun with this. They can do it in ways that can be abusive and can hurt their congregations by, by kind of rubbing their noses in it. But you can also have some real honest Easter talk because, um, because of the way Mark just puts this out there, I think. Yeah, I think especially this year, uh, that a year after, after the pandemic, I mean, we were just kind of moving into shutdowns, you know, in, the, in, in uh, Lent and then Easter last year. And that how uh, I, I think that is a, a, a could be a really important homiletical move this year is uh, is to preach as as Don Jewell talked about uh, and also uh, that we get in um, Blunt and Charles book uh, hearing Mark and two voices uh, that preach the tension uh, preach that space of 
of hope and disappointment, of blindness and insight, of silence and proclamation. Uh, that that how how do we how do we acknowledge that space and and that the way in which the endings you know the added endings later that um, to name that that need that human need uh, to overcome disappointment to name that human need for order and and endings and and that that there are no satisfying endings uh, either in Mark or in life and so. Um, is this a, is this a, this the year really to sit in that in that space of acknowledging those tensions? Uh, I think I think would be uh, would it be an important acknowledgement of how Easter sounds uh, this year, uh, it, it, very different than it has in the past. You know, it's it, it's interesting that um, as I as I think about this text this year, um, Mark. It, the questions and promises and sets of reconciliation that happen throughout Mark are continued early on. You know, you, you can preach through Mark through the early questions. You know, what is this a new teaching with authority? Um, wow. Who is this that even the wind and uh, uh, waves obey him? Who do people say that I am? And then you get one last question from the disciples who will roll away the stone for us. And then you get, a promise. You've had promises throughout the gospel. It's interesting that the gospel ends on an open-ended promise. Um, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him just like he told you. And, that, and then you, that promise is left out there. You don't get the next scene and he appeared to them and, you know, but you don't get that because it ends on this open-ended uh, note of terror. But it's also this promise of reconciliation. Tell his disciples and Peter. You know, Peter who has taken himself away, but with his denial. Um, and plausibly, I mean, one of the things that's even, how do I want to put this? Um, even our uh, breakup with God, even our denials and uh, taking ourselves out of the relationship even those aren't nailed down, even those can be undone, uh, which that in itself can be terrifying um, so that there's even an open-ended reconciliation future for Peter. There's a disruption in just about everything in this text. Rolf, I really appreciate you leaning through the questions that uh, are throughout this account uh, uh, as we uh, credit uh, as the Gospel of Mark. Um, but uh, this, this disruption of um, how do we live in the new normal? Um, so, you know, okay, for three years, our hope had been in this teacher, in the promises that we thought were now coming uh, to um, reality. We've, we've watched all that Jesus has done. And the closure is, okay, going to go to the tomb now that the Sabbath is over. They didn't go in expectation of finding an empty tomb. They didn't go in expectation of the resurrection. They didn't go to set our, uh, uh, to, to set out on the rumors of the resurrection that uh, have invigorated our faith all these generations. They went because they had just had a long day of the reality that Jesus was gone. And okay, what do you do next when somebody dies? There's stuff you just got to take care of. And they go in that mode and that normal is disrupted as is everything else that you each have already named. The disruption of what we thought was the beginning of a short pandemic and now is the beginning of the end of a long year. Uh, the disruption of I doubt it, I denied, I gave up my, I lost my faith, and yet there's still reconciliation. God hasn't given up on me. The disruption of everything that we humanly imagine, that we humanly think we control, is a, is a reminder that God still uh, enters into human history, disrupts our expectations, and if that doesn't cause us to be a bit amazed, and a bit terrified, then maybe we aren't reading the story right. 
or we're also not reading ourselves right. <laughs> Ooh, amen. <laughs> right? That if we think like, oh yeah, well, I've been called to do this, or I have nothing to fear, right? Is there much to say about John 20? Well, yes, uh, but before we before we move on, uh, I, I I wanted to follow up with what Rolf said uh, that 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 going ahead to Galilee. I mean, it, it, narratively, uh, it it's like what seems to be ending is beginning again. It's you know, it's like the story starts over again. And there's something really. Uh, I think there's something really powerful in that. That there's there is no ending then to. Uh, to God's uh, God's work in the world, uh, and so going back to Galilee kind of takes us all the way back to the beginning, uh, and then we go through it again. So, um, and then the other the other sort of homiletical lens that I wanted to throw out this time around is that I've been thinking about is in our preaching. What's what's the what's the homiletical difference, or what's the preaching difference between preaching an empty tomb? And preaching a resurrection appearance, I think that's 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 what we're what we're as we move into John, uh, that that here we're preaching an empty tomb in Mark, and and then in John a resurrection appearance. And so I I I want to throw that out there as uh, something for preachers to think about how how would a how would a, a Easter sermon sound? I think that they should sound different because they're, they're witnessing to different things. Okay, now we can go to John. A few things to say. Anybody want to start? <laughs> Why are they in a garden? Sure. <laughs> you always say that. You always set No, I don't as... understand. What's the point? <laughs> you do this every year. Uh, well, it's very significant, of course. It's... Uh, the, the garden, I mean, garden, the way G John begins, Jesus' arrest was in the garden. He was buried in a garden. Now the resurrection in a garden, so new life. But particularly for Mary, if we skip over the Peter and beloved disciple part, uh, it, is, um, it is her, in part, her call narrative um, of, of, of recognizing. Now she is in the garden with, with Jesus, and, uh, and so... It's uh, the garden is unique to to John in 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 this in this story and in the rest and uh, yeah. Anything also, else you want to say about it, that? It's not just so we can sing. I come to the garden alone. Oh, we yeah. miss we miss that exactly. <laughs> I think it's also significant as we do that circular narrative that John begins in the beginning with the echoes of creation mm -hmm. and creation. It begins, God sets everything up in a garden. And mm -hmm. so that, that narrative uh, circle that you're calling our attention to uh, reminds us that the entry of God into the story is not 2,000 years ago at the resurrection, but it is a God who has never given up on saving the world. Mm -hmm. Matt, you were going to say something. I was gonna make a joke about sheep and gardens, but I, I think the, because he does call her by name, which I think yeah. harkens back yeah. to the idea of a, of a savior who knows the flock. And Lazarus. Oh yeah, and Lazarus too. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I mentioned for those who listen to the Good Friday podcast, the, the idea of witness, I wanna come back to that here. And, and this just got more focalized, Caroline, when you talked about the empty tomb story uh, in contrast to uh, a resurrection appearance. And one of the things I like about all of the various resurrection stories we have are the reminders that nobody quite experiences the resurrection in exactly the same way and, and belief never comes easy to anybody. So you've got these two disciples, Peter and, and the other who see an empty tomb and believe and go home. And you've got Mary who encounters an empty tomb experiences confusion and it doesn't fall into place for her until she hears her name and then is called off to um, to tell others or is sent off to tell others and sometimes we set up contrast between the two or we, we chide Peter and the other disciple for going home as opposed to something else and I see these as more kind of complementary stories as different ways in which you might come to a, a new understanding based on the evidence before you and what does it mean to bear witness 
and how are you moved from unbelief to belief or from confusion to recognition and and to give people a lot of space for that on Easter I think is really important so that Easter doesn't become a now that you're here now that you've heard the songs and sung the sermon you all believe right because that's the goal right we want to make sure you go home believing this but instead to really invite people into the experience that's so what's the word I want? Not even multifaceted, just, but multiple, right? Different ways in which this works. And the gospels, I think, bear witness to that variety. Well, and yeah, I, absolutely. And I, I, that, that space of unrecognition uh, is full of weeping and confusion, uh, and which harkens back also the, the weeping of Laz the story of the death of Lazarus. And so, uh, that recognition doesn't happen right away because in part, this is, this is she's, she's experienced in a sense a double trauma. She was at the foot of the cross and watched Jesus die. And now she goes to the tomb, notice by herself, which is unique to John, alone at the tomb and the tomb is empty. And so and so John gives us this narrative space of this, of this confusion and non-recognition to say, that's okay. Uh, uh, and, and the other thing I, I was with, with, our, with our focus on witness uh, that I was uh, thinking about this time around too, is that Jesus tells her to go and announce his ascension, not his resurrection. I was going to ask about that because yeah. it, this is unique. I don't know what it means. I am ascending to my father mm -hmm. and your father. Yeah. And that's the, because that's the fullness of John's, you know, the, what is eternal life is, is, is that relationship with God and with Jesus that Jesus is preparing a place. And so he's returning to the father. And uh, so the, you know, resurrection is, is awesome, but the real, you know, glory is going to be the ascension. So she, he asks Mary, he says to Mary, go and announce my ascension. She neither announces the ascension nor the resurrection. Notice that? She announced, she simply says, I have seen the Lord. She testifies to where she is. She doesn't offer, offer a creedal statement or a... Uh, but she testifies to where she is and I, and, and what she, and not even knowing what it means yet. I have seen the Lord, but I don't even know if I know what that means. And so I think that would be a, an incredible Easter sermon this year. Just testify to what you, what you are seeing. And that doesn't have to do with understanding or making sense or getting the creeds right or the doctrine right or having, you know, understanding resurrection because who can. And so that's what I heard this year is just this like permission to testify. This is what I have seen. And that's what we get with Mary Magdalene. I don't know if I'm rushing us out or not, uh, but Caroline, what you just said and, and Matt, what you said a little bit earlier uh, bears witness, I think, to uh, what is happening in Acts in the sense that um, everybody's gonna have their own encounter. Everybody's going to respond differently and that's okay. Uh, and, and so it, where Peter is speaking, God shows no partiality. I mean, it's to every nation, anyone who fears him and does. There's this call for this kind of diversity of expression, of encounter, of response that is highlighted again in, in the testimony of Peter at, in, in, as recorded in Acts, which you two have just pointed out uh, from the resurrection story, uh, uh, empty tomb story, if we go back and forth between yeah. that. Uh, yeah, I was reading about, I was reading about this part of Acts in a book and I really liked what it said. It said, Acts doesn't depict the conversion as a penitent change of heart or the sudden emergence of a new religious state of mind. It's about being brought close into close fellowship, fellowship with God through the arrival of the spirit. I just thought that was really smart and powerful. Thanks, Matt.
Way to That's go, a good looking book. People who aren't watching us on YouTube don't know what you're talking about, though. I'm reading from Matt Skinner's book, Axe, Catching Up with the Spirit. Here it is. Well, thank you. I, sometimes you hear stuff you wrote and you think, really? Yeah, you you really are that smart. Really? Uh, well, I, I say, uh, here's something else I say a lot when I repeat myself about the book of Acts. Uh, Chapter 10 here, there's a lovely contrast between the public nature of Jesus, well, public ministry throughout Galilee, that Peter's saying, you know, he did all this stuff in public and everybody knows about this. But when it comes to resurrection, we were chosen as witnesses. And that's not necessarily a, an elitism or a power play on Peter's part. That's just the way it was, because this tends to be how God works in the Bible liking to work through the few or the particular or the local and then having global effects. We see that in the, in the election of Israel and many other stories. That's one of the frustrating things about resurrection for me about Easter is all we have are the testimonies of a few witnesses and the people they told and the people they told. That's how it works. And so I know there are people out there uh, apologists, they call themselves, who want to want to want to prove this or show that it's that it's reasonable belief, right? And there's good reason to you know to believe this. And I find myself so utterly uninterested in those kinds of discussions or arguments <laughs> because it's finally uh, it's about bearing witness. And what do you need? How much information do you need? Or what kind of experiences do you need before you feel like you yourself can bear witness to this? And the answer to that is probably changing or changeable, right? It depends on, on how bad life is or who's around me or what I'm able to glimpse in a particular moment, which I think is a really important way of preaching about Easter or talking about Easter, largely because it invites conversation among a congregation, right? What do you, what do you need? Not what do you need to believe? That's not the right question, right? But what is, what's convincing to you or whose witness compels you and why? Well, and, and, and the invitation to that, that breadth of where you're going to, what are you going to give witness to, uh, and, and that witness changes, uh, that our testimony changes, and how different our testimony is this year compared to a year ago in terms of, of what we have seen. And that in verse 39, we are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. We are witnesses to all that he did. And so then you get, of course, the, uh, the, the witness of the crucifixion and the, and the resurrection and the resurrection and the, um, and, but, but that all that he did, I think is an invitation to say where, uh, and, and in particular, maybe on, again, a year later, like, where, what, what kind of ways are you giving witness to what Jesus is doing? Uh, and, now, and, and now maybe through the lens of the resurrection. So that's just to say, I think there's that, not, you don't, not that you need permission, but there's that invitation in that verse uh, to, uh, to expand on what you are saying, Matt. I think that, that that points us at least for a moment in the direction of 1 Corinthians 15. Um, where Paul uh, talks about the chain of witnesses and the and, and appearances, um, and even then the one he you know he, the appearance to himself, um, and uh, that, but then especially uh, you know the ending is powerful. Uh, maybe we just leave it at that. That it says you know that. Um, so whether it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe, and really. It's. Not, I mean, the worst thing you could try to do on Easter is prove the resurrection. It's really about proclaiming um, that the relationship that Mary has with Jesus, uh, when Jesus says to her, Mary, is the relationship that God still makes available uh, to all of us. And working preacher, through you and through your proclamation, that God makes that relationship available to so many people. And so we are grateful uh, for your continuing proclamation. A reminder in that call uh, is that for them, the testimony is the testimony of the prophets first. 
uh, I, I said this uh, earlier and, and repeat it again, that this is a testimony in the first century of people who have had the scriptures that are not what we call the New Testament. And that we, we need to remind ourselves that this came from the testimony of the prophets, of the law and the prophets, of the promise of the creator covenanting God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so that proclamation, we are being invited, that testimony that we are being invited to offer is the same witness that God has always been forming a people to do, forming a community who would eventually have a world or a global effect. The nation of Israel was called that all the nations would be blessed. The encounter of the few that are named in uh, the gospel accounts are so that you and I today would be able to do that, to bear that same witness that God is, that God is good and that God hasn't given up on the world, no matter how much we need the intrusion of the Holy Spirit.